Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back, of course, to the channel. I'm trying to do a little more of these. You know, we just had Shane Davis on not too long ago. We were talking about comics, the industry, and it's always important to get the perspective of, of industry veterans. Uh, I've been a longtime customer of comics, as you guys uh, know, covering it more so as a fan before recently entering into the more uh, publishing and uh, create creative space uh, that's involved there. Um, but there's people that have been doing it longer than I've uh, even been alive. And uh, ironically, the people that we have on today where they are a vital part of my growth, certainly mm -hmm. as a comic book fan, considering the simple fact that definitely in the 90s, this was these were the books that I were uh, was certainly reading. So we've had both of these gentlemen on before, but I'd like to welcome back because we have them as a tandem today. Great <laughs> Chuck Dixon, Graham Nolan, man. How y'all doing? Hey, bud. How are you? Doing good. Glad you. to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm doing great. I'm so glad that we could make this uh happen this is actually again big for me i know i told both of you guys this is kind of a little surreal i know we talked about this graham i believe even on your channel about how this is this whole kind of space is connecting everything's coming kind of full circle and definitely for me as a as a younger guy it's not only an honor to have you guys here to be able to speak with you guys but even just to be able to 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 chop it up considering that well the y'all's books were what I was reading when I was uh, when I was growing up. So I, I'm, I'm glad to certainly have both of you guys here. And I appreciate you guys taking some time to to sure. chat about everything it is that you guys have going as well as everything going on in the comic book industry. And before we get into that, because we certainly are going to speak on what it is that you guys are working with. I kind of have to, you know, it's always the, always the update your resume thing that I have to do because some people this will be the first video that they've seen of mine, of yours, uh, as far as being on the channel. So we have to ask questions that that um, that <laughs> you guys have to answer probably every day <laughs> that you do these. But I think it'll be it'll be good for everybody involved. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Chuck. I, I just want to just give us a breakdown of kind of your introduction into more so the space as just a lover, even if it, you know, we can get to the writing stuff uh, here in a little bit, but what was it for you that, okay, hey, hey, I'm a youngster and I'm getting into comics. What was that kind of bridge uh, for you? Well, I kind of share the origin with a lot of comic book creators. And I was sick a lot as a kid. And, you know, there were three TV channels <laughs> and that was it. So uh, uh, I, I fell in love with comics. There were comics everywhere back then. You went to the barber shop, there were comics. The drugstore, there were comics. I, the farmer's market, there were comics. And I just fell in love with the medium uh, in a big way. And uh, I, I just never looked back. I never wanted to do anything else but work in this medium. That makes sense. Uh, is it similar for uh, you, uh, Graham, or was there like a more defining kind of kind of moment? Uh, there was a more defining moment. Um, I wasn't a sickly kid, um, but uh, I was a monster kid. Uh, I discovered uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman when I was like eight years old and fell in love with monsters and started reading monster magazines and in particular one called the Monster Times, which also covered the comic book world uh, it, back in the early 1970s. And uh, so I would read about these Phil Suling conventions and who was being nominated for what and all that. So that was my first like introduction to the world of comics but then in the sixth grade my teacher brought in a stack of comics for kids to read during recess and one of them was a 60 cent giant um justice league comic and it had superman batman aquaman the flash all these characters that i knew from other media and i just like just absorbed that i thought oh my god this stuff is so cool look at these great drawings and these bright colors and all that and it was then at 12 years old i knew that's exactly what i wanted to do that's that's amazing well i mean let's i guess get into like the 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 what we know you guys for is obviously the writing and the, and the art like i mean i can imagine that it's a different it's a different game now as opposed to how people are getting let's say into the industry a lot has changed we'll get into talking about some of that as well but certainly when you guys were coming up like what was that uh uh chuck like what was your first like i guess big gig uh, if you will, in, in just being a, a writer kind of in, in comics that were being, uh, of course, published. Well, it, it kind of happened simultaneously uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, I got uh, I got the regular gig on Airboy at Eclipse. And, and like within two weeks, uh, I was working for Larry Hama uh, on Savage Sword of Conan. 
And, uh, you know, eventually I got the, the main Conan gig and that allowed me to go full time. So mm-hmm. it was really two breaks at one time. That's 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 actually uh, awesome. It's funny because, like, I, I know it's a different animal now. Um, I mean, we speak what you will about the about the mainstream. I don't know if they're sending their best uh, I- anymore. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem like they're bringing people on based on merit uh, <laughs> at all. I don't seem to think uh, uh, that's a thing. But I guess before we get into you guys, obviously working as a tenant, which a lot of people uh, certainly know you guys for teaming up for. Uh, Graham, like, what was that? What was that first big gig? Like, where it was like, all right, well, this is my opportunity, and you know, I'm kind of, you know, people get to put a put a name on on a particular project, and they get to associate it with you. Well, I'll say this: it's 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 harder for a writer to break in than an artist because yeah. you, I can show a portfolio, and an editor with a decent eye can say it's either good or bad. Most most people don't want to spend the time to read a script, a spec script, particularly. So you almost have to be published small time to be able to get you know, somebody from Marvel or DC to take a look at you as a writer. Um, But for me, uh, my first professional sale was actually as a student. I was at the Kubert School and my teacher bought two classroom stories for a new talent showcase for DC Comics. And he sort of mentored me uh, because I used to go in every Thursday to DC and he would take me around and introduce me to editors and stuff like that so I could make uh, connections with them because that was huge back then. Mm. was making connections with editors uh let them know your face and and, right. and so many jobs came because you happened to be in the office and something landed <laughs> on a guy's desk you know and he would say you know hey you know this just came in it's a 10 page story for you know weird war tales whatever and i need it next week you know that's one of those great opportunities that you would have as an artist to show your stuff, show your timeliness and your professionalism all at once. And if you if you played your cards right and you did it, you usually got offered more work. Um, so I would go in every Thursday and then we would go out to dr- for drinks at a bar and I'd hang out with guys like uh, Gray Morrow and Dick Giordano and listen to them tell stories about the industry and stuff and I'd shut my big Irish mouth and open my ears <laughs> and listen, listen to what these guys had to say. Cause there was uh, words of iron being spoken at that point. It was, it was a great learning experience for me. Um, but that was my first professional work. And then, then I ended up with Chuck uh, at eclipse. So that was my first regular gig was, okay. was doing work at eclipse for um, uh, Airboy. Uh, it was actually sky wolf, uh, the backup for Airboy, and then the prowler, uh, which is all part of, Chuck and Tim Truman's Four Winds packaging group. Yeah, uh, so I was about to ask that. I mean, you just answered my question, kind of what was that first um, gig that you guys teamed up with? I mean, it's very rare that um, we see, I mean, people that are working within, let's say, the comic book industry, and now everything's kind of jumbled up. You see this artist will work with this writer and all and all that. But there seems to be kind of a, a general association with, with the two of you, mainly because of the work has been so so iconic and and it, it just it, they, they just get it and i also i feel like me and cliff richards have that kind of feel as well where it's like i don't have to explain much of anything to him other than what's on that and he can adapt it was that something that you guys recognize like and either one of you guys can answer or both um like that you guys recognize immediately like okay we work so well together and we're just going to create awesome things I think so. I mean, Chuck doesn't remember this, but after our first job together, that first Skywolf story, he sent me a postcard uh, just to say, hey, man, uh, I love the collaboration. This is this was really great. I loved what you did type of thing. Just, you know, out of the blue, um, never received anything like that. Um, so uh, I, I think I think that we uh, we clicked right from the get go. Yeah, we both like the same stuff. And I think we both have exactly the same level of passion for this. Uh, mm-hmm. We want to do our best work. We want to do quality work. And it's all yeah. about the story. It's all about yeah. storytelling. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's uh, sort of lost on on the industry, uh, which, again, I want to get into all of that um, here, here in a bit. But, I mean, I, I just want to know, I, I know it, it can be different as a writer as opposed to let's say an artist and when you start to see kind of uh, that material be adapted elsewhere something that you had a, a you were a vital role or you played a vital role in the creation you know we spoke a little bit about it off uh, off air we both spoke on our channel we talked about bane 
uh certainly for ex example like just like how does how in the world does that feel because you guys obviously have been i mean to even just write either batman or batman and as batman's family seems to be like the gig uh to to get like in dc uh certainly it was at the time because that's the I, their most iconic character unless you're talking about superman as well you can have that debate but certainly with 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 batman but you know with a, with a character like bane and then we obviously know we go into like the movies and all that stuff that you guys obviously you know had had a vital role how does that like feel when you create something like that and then it kind of just uh you have an iconic storyline and then from that extends this whole new world of uh with it uh, centered around this character to the point to where you're starting to see him appear in, in in various different mediums you know like movies like uh toys and like all this other stuff is that like uh, i don't know if bane was one of the first kind of big ones uh for you guys but like how just as a creative does that even feel I, I mean, obviously, it's the character will be, you know, unless we create something else in the future, <laughs> this is going to be the character we're remembered for uh, right now. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it still early really hasn't dawned on me. It's it's because, you know, people make you watch a TV show and they make a reference to Bane. You yeah. Know? And and the thing is, they make a reference in such a way that they know the audience knows who he is. They yeah. don't have to explain it. And it's like, that's wow. That's hard to get your head around. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of torn. Uh, I haven't liked any of the uh, adaptations other than uh, when when we first heard about uh, um, Batman the Animated Series doing a Bane oh, yeah. story. Oh, yeah. That was exciting. And then when I saw the, the action figure for it, that was really cool. Uh, but after that, uh, I haven't really uh, liked a lot of the stuff that's been done with the character. Um, and, you know, just uh, there's some issues with DC Comics, which kind of sour me uh, about it. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I tend to try to, you know, I just I put it behind me. It's something I did in the past and I, I uh, I'm proud of it and all that. Um, but I try to focus on the future. Yeah, I can imagine that part being difficult. Definitely when you see kind of uh, either a bastardization or you see something like that's not who this character is. Uh, was ever meant to be um i could imagine that being something that can be certainly a, a bit frustrating because you know i guess the thing about writing a character like that is that inevitably you're going to get people that pick it up and if the if the be it from the editorial or be it from the company itself if they don't have the same level going into the future a passion that you had when you created it then you it's, it's going to be very very difficult to kind of let that to, to really make something like that happen. I know, Chuck, we talked about Birds of Prey, uh, for example, which to me, you did the definitive uh, kind of uh, uh, stuff with that. And then that movie, holy shit, I don't think you ever saw it. Did you ever? Uh, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't subject myself to something. Yeah, so it's so good. <laughs> good that you never saw it because you probably would have, uh, you know, because I lit a fuse. I can imagine what, what you would have uh, certainly uh, uh, done, but. You know, uh, I, I know that it certainly has to be di difficult in it. And I guess to get into kind of, we know you guys got did all the work through the 90s, all the stuff that certainly I've, I, I've read and we've talked about extensively on this channel. But, you know, obviously there was a shift going into the, you know, going to 2010s and, and stuff, just a more cultural shift with whatever direction that, that DC and Marvel as well, and, and where it is that they were going, that unfortunately found, uh, uh, you know, I know we talked about it a bit, Chuck, you kind of on the outside looking in where it's like, well, these guys either don't want you around anymore, uh, despite all the level of good work that it is that you guys has done. <laughs> is there like a time where you felt that kind of cultural shift um uh happening to where it was like these guys don't want us and maybe it became so heavily politicized that it just wasn't going to happen in the event that you were a uh individual that wasn't some like deranged leftist or you had to just suppress everything to where nobody knew what it is that you were because hell if you'd let them know that was the last gig you were ever going to get was there ever like again was it a defining moment how was it when uh, when uh, or when was it when you found that kind of just cultural shift within uh, more so DC, but we can bring Marvel in as well. 
Well, the marker for me was when Denny O'Neill retired. And that was the end of an era. Now, Denny O'Neill's a <clears throat> proud, bleeding heart liberal. Didn't mind yeah, being yeah. called a bleeding heart liberal. And he and I saw eye to eye on nothing outside of comics. Yeah. But, but comics, that was the only thing that was important. Yeah. So we were friends. He certainly rewarded me with lots and lots of work, you know, that, you know, got, really made me a name in the business. I'll always owe him that. I, I, I loved Denny. He was a great guy. But when he left, he was replaced with a bunch of editors who politics was kind of at the forefront. And it was a kind of narcissistic identity politics we see today. Yeah. And it was there. It was right there. It's not as much in the open in the comics, but inside the industry. Mm. You know, where they would say, well, you have to call this editor and apologize for something you said. I was like, I'm not apologizing for anything I said. <laughs> well, you won't get the job then. I said, then I won't get the job. Yeah. Yeah. But I start apologizing, it's never gonna end. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> you'll you'll be that's uh <laughs> I think a lot of people find that out kind of the hard way. It'll never be enough anyway, right? Uh mm -hmm. when you do apologize or you know, for them, and it's more so you're not apologizing for the statement, they want you to apologize because they felt some kind of way uh about right. it more than anything. You know, it's not right. that you were incorrect or or it's more like how you made them them uh feel ground was it similar with uh with you when you started to kind of notice the more notice a cu cultural shift well it was a little different for me because i bounced out of comics around 2001 and got into newspaper strips and i was mm -hmm. working for newspaper syndicates for uh like uh 14 years 13 years <clears throat> um and i would do occasional freelance comic book jobs because the syndicate work was soul sucking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so i would do a, a occasional jobs uh and then i decided well i'm gonna leave this i want to go back into comics uh and see how it goes and it was slow going at, at first and you know the thing i want to stress is that you know chuck and i politically we're definitely lean to the right but we're not ideologues and right it's never in our work you never see it in our work right um, we're not trying to preach to anybody. We're just trying to tell great stories. Uh, what you do in the, in, in the ballot box uh, with the ballot boxes is, is your own personal and private thing. It shouldn't be even a part of your work. Right. Uh, but by having said that, everybody knows how we are because we have discussions, editorial discussions, things come up, you know, and you have discuss you, you, you have debates and, and you agree to disagree, as Chuck said, with Denny, you know. There was never an argument with him. He knew where we stood. We knew where he stood. And, <clears throat> you know, let's make great comics. Um, that's it's just that just doesn't exist anymore because there are ideologues in there. And, and that's more important than making money for their companies. Which is insane, right? Because you think yeah. that, that that would be the the it, it, and I don't know. It's like I certainly felt that going definitely in the 2010s where I know you had remember that all new, all different Marvel stuff. And then DC was doing all even what they were doing with some of the new 52 stuff. It was like, yeah, this is like what what is really going on with this company where they were seeming to prioritize um, things that really didn't matter. Like story was secondary um, to to actually the enjoyment that it got from the audience or or really honoring these characters or whatever it is that you want to, to call it that made us all like fall in love with it. It seemed that that was kind of slowly being chipped away. And now it's to the point to where pretty much all these cats, at least these named cats out there in the industry, they're, they're open about beating you over the head uh, with everything. They can't stop talking about whatever social justice sort of motive or narrative it is that they're attempting to do sort of in, in, in comics. And not only has, have they alienated the creatives that obviously like you guys, where it's like, yeah, they're, they're, they may reach out to you. They may not, but you know, for the most part, they're going to give those gigs to someone else, even though uh, you guys are much better than a lot of these cats that they got working over there. But you know, they also alienated the audience, you know, because it's like, I don't know where these guys got the moronic idea that everybody who reads comics are just leftists or like social justice advocates or it's just not the case. You know what I mean? People are going to be you don't get that big. Right. Unless you are appealing to people that are obviously going to be on different sides of uh, of any given political spectrum. And that seems to be be uh, be kind of lost uh, on them. And I think you've seen more of like the bastardization, you know, of, of some of these defining uh, uh, characters. I know, Chuck, I guess we could bring it up again because I know we talked about it on my channel with 
with like the Tim Drake situation, which you've obviously done so much work uh, on that. And that damn the recent one didn't even make it damn 10 issues, which I don't know if I've ever seen that before. But like an ongoing series to get cut off at the legs that early. I don't know if I've seen something like that, especially something that they leaned on so much. Definitely with the whole oh, now Tim, uh, Tim Drake's bisexual and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, it didn't seem to sell any comics uh at something like that but chuck like i mean give me a some or you can give the audience some level of perspective there i don't think people understand i know we talked about it on our channel but just to kind of re reiterate this point like you did so much work uh uh with this with this character and then out of nowhere it's not like they made him more interesting it's just no oh. <laughs> he's bisexual now uh and we're gonna lead with that and it's like okay but like what where was your mind at as you saw all that unfold too as of recently i think it was as of either this week or late last week now they're like oh we're done we, we can't sell this 10 issues we're, we're cutting it off well i mean you know there's a certain amount of schadenfreude that they failed i mean for a comic to be canceled at issue 10 they usually give it 12 issues yeah right? sales must have been absolutely dreadful and and you look at it and it's like yeah you got yeah you went viral with it you got all kinds of coverage and everything else but that didn't translate into sales yep. and it never does translate into sales. You know, unless you got something like Superman, Mary and Lois Lane, you know, uh, you know, this, this one's gay, this one's bi, you know, this one's asexual. It just doesn't sell comics. Uh, it, it does the opposite. I mean, look, the, the, the three of us are serving an underserved portion of the comic reading public, the mm -hmm. people that walked away from all this crap, mm -hmm. but still wanted good comics. And that's what we're providing for them. You know, yeah. and we're not preaching. We don't have an agenda. Yep. And like you said, you know, when they, they say, well, we're, we'll make him gay. Well, what about a personality? You know, what about what's 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 interesting about that? Right. Well, there's nothing interesting. Absolutely nothing. It's like saying, oh, this guy's straight. Yeah, yeah exactly. Else? Oh, nothing. Well, he dangles string. You know, uh, <laughs> he wears his hat backwards. I mean, uh, you know, that's not that's a gimmick that's you know it's stupid yeah. right like for uh for you i don't know if you've seen any uh like i don't know we talked about bane but uh has there been any kind of uh uh any other perspective that you can offer i don't know if there's any other characters that you had a vital role in uh obviously adapting um and we obviously know what you did with the bat family where you're like you see them just being absolutely ran into the ground and you're like what the hell is hell is this and you know it's not even a payoff to, to chuck's point uh for the companies because it's not like they're getting sales we've seen unit sales decline um i mean we're getting it to historic lows uh now in terms of the unit sales they can brag about the money and try to take credit for like manga but in terms of unit sales those continue to plummet uh for for really any, anything else you got some perspective that you can give us kind of on what you've been been seeing even with some of the characters that you've been you've uh, had a vital role in uh adapting well, they've 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 certainly uh, ran Batman into the ground. It's the only thing that they can say does sell is, is some of those bad titles. And to say that I'm hedging it because it's those aren't great numbers. I mean, those were cancellation numbers practically. Years yeah, yeah, ago. yeah. And this is Batman. Um, you know, I love the character since I was a, a a little boy and always wanted to work on him. And I, I did a whole show recently uh, on my channel about what makes Batman a great character. And it's everything that they are not doing. Um, they've all adapted the the Frank Miller uh, nihilistic, oh, yeah. uh, revenge oriented Batman, and they're they're skipping the thing that makes him special, and that is the the Galahadian quest. Uh, and there's where the heroism, the classic heroism, comes from. It's like the guy's a billionaire; he he could live his life comfortably now. It, it doesn't matter, but he uses his money. He uses his brilliance he uses his skills to make life better in that city for other people and that's the heroic nature there's nothing heroic about anybody whose motives are simply for their own revenge or nihilistic needs uh but that's what we get the, right. that's the batman that everybody's leaning hard into and uh it, it's a and and you throw into that um the the brady bunch family uh, there's so many freaking people that are in this bat world that know Batman and know Bruce Wayne. And it's like, come on, man. He works best when he's a loner and he's out in Gotham and the, 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 the criminal elements are afraid of him because they don't know anything about him. 
Everybody knows. I mean, he's practically uh, Adam West anymore. He can walk down the street and take, <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. To answer your question, uh, yeah, they're they're doing so much wrong with their <laughs> flagship character, which is uh, insane. Like, imagine of all characters to be able to kind of screw up. I think Batman is like you have to. I think I could say that for a lot of those other characters, where it's like. You kind of have to go out of your way to screw up Batman. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's um Well, they have because they've had Batman now has panic attacks. They mm. just did a whole story where he's having panic attacks. Well, they had him wet his pants. Yeah. Oh, and when he was uh, you know, like in college and he was touring the world, he was at this monastery and he was exploring other sexuality too, you know, because yeah. I remember seeing that one, yeah. Yeah. It's like that's not important, but for like what I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, if you think that is different. I think that you you have yes, subpar writers. That's of course part of it. You have these subpar maybe uh, editors that are part of it as well. Yes. But when you have these ideologues, right, who feel as if you know, because I, I I'd imagine like for example, you said what makes Batman Batman. That's certainly a great perspective because you go into it with the mindset as you're going to do art on them or you're going to chuck some write on them, whatever it's going to be that, okay, there's something that's already been established or something that's already been, been understood. I can give a fresh story and all that, but there's, there's certain elements of, of him that we need to make sure we keep around because otherwise it's not the character, right? Correct. Whereas to a lot of these guys are more so like, how do I make this character look and act like i want them to look as a an act as opposed to this we already know who he is just make him be who that character uh certainly is and it's been such an in interesting thing to see folks i talk about uh this one writer who she's doing a lot of harley quinn stuff and and uh she's an interesting character she's not very fond of me uh at all but you know she continues like she like with the whole vixen situation it's like well, because she, as in the writer, is like this uh, lesbian woman or, or whatever. She's like, well, I need to make the character do that as well. So yeah. now she has Vic <clears throat> and hitting on like some disabled uh, uh, lesbian chick. And I'm like, that's not Vic. So what, what, who, in, who in the hell is this? Like, but that's her. That Those are all the boxes that she checks. So it's like, well, I need to live through these characters mm -hmm. and I need to use them as a vehicle for my own personal uh, political views to me that like in itself kind of embodies the the fundamental core issue um with like with comics really right now and that you have these people that are using these characters as more so vehicle for their own political views social views political agendas as opposed to just doing what works doing what the you know and honoring the the characters that's something that i'll start with you chuck and that's something that you you would agree with at all well you know i mean Let's face it, in the past, there's been crappy Batman stories. There's yep. been writers who aren't very good to write yep. Batman, but there were guidelines. So you had to stay, you had to stay within those guidelines. I mean, I remember we were doing a story where we were we were breaking Batman down before nightfall. We were exhausting yep. him in the stories. And I did a story where Batman is on a ledge staking a guy out and he falls asleep. And I'm like, man. I called Denny and I said, is that okay to do? I don't want to diminish the character. Right. And he goes, no, no, in this context, that's perfect. That's perfect. That really, the readers will be shocked by him falling asleep on that ledge. Yeah. And, and so we went with that, but you know, to just take it and make it whatever it is in your life. I and mean, I, I guess it comes from narcissism. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the idea that these writers, they've never had a real job, you know, they're <laughs> right out of college or they worked at a, you know, TV network or something. Mm -hmm. And they've never they they've never experienced real life, so they they the only thing they have to draw on is their own you know miserable existences, and, <laughs> yeah, and their, own, and their own kink, which is yeah, that's where it gets bizarre. real weird. Yeah, I, I would even go further to say that a lot of them are exercising their own demons into the characters mm -hmm. that their writing is their uh, their uh, psychologist couch. You know, that they're sitting on the couch and, and, and some writers in particular, and I won't name names here, but, uh, you know, uh, to read their stories is, is like uh, you're reading the notes that the psychologist <laughs> took as the guy laid on the couch. And it's like, this isn't Batman. This this whole uh, this, this whole interaction here is wrong. It never would happen this way. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a boring. Uh, it diminishes the character. It's 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 just um, 
they're not willing to accept the fantasy. They want to make it their world, as you said, Eric, that they're uh, uh, they're trying to make these characters into themselves. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it's, it's uh, it makes them weak and it makes the characters boring. And uh, that's the worst thing you can do in entertainment is bore somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what happened to mainstream science fiction. You know, you're, you're reading basically in the 70s, it started to become, you know, taxi cab confessions in space. Right. You know, where you learned a lot more about the writer than you did about the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it does certainly take a level of narcissism to, to do something like that. And then, now we have the element of social social media. I mean, there, there was once upon a time where, uh, you know, when you found the thoughts and the political position, certainly of these guys, it was buried in some like article or, or, or something of that nature. Whereas to now it's just they're they're posting about it and uh, they're letting their audience know, like the previous writer that I was talking about. I remember she did this like weird, like dream three way, three way kiss with. um Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and some. I was like, what in the? And then like, so she and she bragged about it. She was like, all right, well, uh, on Twitter, like, I'm, I'm like, hey, this is like the first three way kiss. And I was like, what in the? Like, who is who is reading? First of all, who is gonna read this nonsense? But yeah, you're just letting everybody in on the fact that this is something that you're, you, you know, you're bragging about, right? Right. So for me, it's like, again, it does take a certain level of, of narcissism, but. I don't know if it also has a lot to do with the economics. These guys don't really have a whole lot of true skin in the game. Um, yeah. I do think as we get to talking about the independent stuff, it's a little different now uh, where you have people that like crowdfunding introduced a completely new element to this. And it's like, well, my bottom line is dependent on how good this book does. This isn't like just some regular commission anymore. This is like, I, I'm trying to eat or, you know, I have a family I got to take care of. And, you know, you, you kind of more have to be, more tapped into what the audience wants and, and it being hyper emphasizing the, the sort of uh, entertainment element, because if you don't have that, then you don't have the sales. Whereas to these guys are going to get probably, maybe they got some bonuses and, you know, maybe uh, uh, sort of negotiated in there. If some of these young guys were able to do that, but they get their commission. It's like, Hey, I'm using this as a vehicle to probably move on to my next gig, which is right. probably TV. It seems like all these guys have, are aspiring to be uh if they haven't already been uh in, in tv and they write like it too uh even though it's a it's a kind of a different medium it doesn't seem uh, as appropriate with some of these some of these guys but you know i guess to move on to some of the independent work we'll talk about you guys stuff it's like that transition there right? i mean we've had, we had a whole new it's a, the game's changed right crowdfunding for example introduced a new game uh, but also the the more in the truly independent, not like this gimmicky independent where it's like they're all circling the same damn talent anyway. It's like doing the same things. It's not like independent. They all go through the same guys. Whereas to a lot of the stuff that you know we're doing, you guys come from a space that I don't come from, and that is that you saw you were you experienced being in in, in mainstream while also being on top of basically the biggest books right during that during that period of time and then moving into this newer space where you're doing things uh more independently in a new kind of updated economic kind of way be it with the crowdfunding element be it with the internet and what that's what that's been like so do you would you say and you know I've talked about with this with other creatives in our space as well like that have done that that kind of work like do you think financially, let's start there. Never mind like where you're going to be at mental, mentally, but just as a in a financial space, is this better, right? Than than what it what it was for you guys being like in the mainstream chasing those commissions? Well, I mean, there was never job security uh with the main company because you could be axed at any moment. They could yeah. just decide they don't like you anymore. And um, so we create, you know, we created our own luck. You know? Yeah. And, and we, we did that because we're lifers. We came from the era, era of comics that when you got into comics, this is all you wanted to do. You, you didn't want to go work at Vanity Fair. You didn't want to go work at MTV. 
you won't be, is this what you want to do to the day you die? And Eric, now you're a lifer too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're in the club. Yeah. No, Comics keep pulling me back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you have to make your own luck. You have to, you know, and people say, well, if DC or Marvel call, would you go back? And I was like, I, I wouldn't take the pay cut. <laughs> I love it. Yep. So, and look, and look, 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 look what you've done. Look, what, I, I have so much admiration for what Graham has done. Just to use the balls to go out there and just do your own thing. Yeah. You know, and, and build that audience. And that I mean, that's hard work. I, I can't do it. I'm lazy. Yeah. That's <laughs> not. Nah. I just want to sit here and make stuff up. I don't nah. want to be doing all that nah, stuff. Like, like, and, I, and I love that perspective because, you know, I found out real quickly, like with some of the stuff that I'm doing, like I'm paying these guys better than what they were getting, like at oh, yeah. the bigger uh, companies. I'm like, wow. The fact that I can even do that is is amazing. I mean, it does speak only of them, but I mean, we because there's, I guess, not a, th th those resources can't be allocated because there's not fifty million uh, like middlemen that we have to pay in order to make a project. It's like, okay, right. I want if I want Chuck to do something, or if I want a commission, like it's like, all right, hey, let's make it happen. Bam, we're we're done here. There's no there's no middleman that I got to pay to make. Well, you make have sure. the level of overhead you're comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. Level you know of overhead I mean? you can bear, and you know it because you're writing the checks. So you know exactly. So it it, yeah. it works out not just for myself. Uh, but certainly the creatives that we bring on and that to me is the dream of it all to be able to like, OK, I want these guys. Yeah, it, pretty much all these guys have not been able to get a raise in forever. And I'm Shane. I was talking on with Shane Davis the other day and he's talking about like since 2002, like there hasn't been truly in page rates like a big, a big like raise uh, in, in this industry. So the fact that I can we're in a position to even be able to pay better than what they're getting with other guys, which means they can do their best work. Right. Um, they can feel good about doing their best work because they're going to be in a better mental state. Like, um, I believe this is certainly the way of the future. What about you, Graham? I know you've been in, in a great position as well to Chuck's Chuck's uh, point in being like a creator and you're doing what you're doing with Compass Comics. Like that differentiation financially, like that that has to be a stark difference. Oh, it is. Uh, it, 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 it's the greatest thing in my career was uh, was when that publishing paradigm changed and, and crowdfunding became something. I'm working harder than I ever have, of course. but I'm working for me uh, and everything comes back to me. Uh, I own all my IP. Um, I can do what I want. Uh, if I want to go out on a limb and do some crazy story, there's nobody to tell me no. You know, uh, other than the fan base that's going to support it or not support it. Yep. Uh, and that's the true free market. And and uh, but that's how you get hits, too, is is not trying to to recreate the wheel. It's it's about trying to do something a little bit different that might strike a new audience. Yep. Uh, and, and, and that's where I'm at, you know, uh, I'm just, I'm having the time of my life doing this stuff and financially, uh, it, it's so much better. Yeah. It, it is so much better. Uh, you know, when you were a freelancer and you worked on a job, when you got to about page 15 of that job, you were checked out. You're thinking about, I got to get another job after yeah. this. And you're, yeah. you're now you're, you're thinking about what, what am I, what do I got lined up? How do I get something lined up? So those last few pages aren't getting the same heart that those first few pages did because you're trying to think about where that next paycheck is going to come from. And you got to line that up. Um, and that's very stressful. Oh, I can imagine. And I yeah. guess that, that, that leads me to my next question before we get into like kind of the stuff that you're working on. I, I don't know the relationship with maybe guys that maybe you guys have that maybe are still doing stuff in the industry. Do you get a sense of, like there's a, uh, a like they're on edge, let's say that with um, the guys that are maybe still there because it is different. But not just that they're seeing the alternatives kind of uh, thrive and flourish. And it looked which you didn't really have a whole. Yeah, you had image kind of do that thing like, yes, th those things have <clears> existed. <throat> but now it's like different. It's like guys are able to uh, come out. of you got like guys like me who kind of wintered in from the from the the other like you'd be the content creation spread spin as a fan and then kind of just took that and said, all right, we're going to start our own business. And then it just popped immediately. That was unheard of back in the, uh, back in the gap where that's a very, very doable thing. Do you get a sense that, that uh, the guys, I don't know if you, again, if you are in conversation with anybody else that they're looking at either, you know, yourselves or even maybe some other, some of our colleagues like, well, you guys got it made. And I don't know if I'm in the best position because like you said, 
tomorrow. Hell, we just heard DC cover DC laying off all these people. Who knows what, the, what, what what's going to go on with these companies? Have I don't know if you guys have had those conversations or if you get that feeling when talking to people that are maybe sticking around. Well, there the, the definitely is word on the street. You know, we're, we're, I, I know I'm hearing from people who know people and, and you know, uh, people sometimes are reaching out under the table like, hey, what's it like? You know, but yeah. they don't want to come out and and announce yeah, themselves, you know, because they're afraid of losing that paycheck. But the other reality is, is that not everybody can do it. Um, you could be an incredible writer or an incredible artist, but it takes something extra to be your own businessman. Uh, and that's what you have to do. You you have to inculcate yourself into all aspects of the business, not just your 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 little slot of I'm a penciler or I'm an inker or whatever. You got to understand lettering, coloring. Um, you got to pay people for that. You have to understand publishing. You have to talk to printers and understand paperweights and all the other stuff, shipping, fulfillment. All these things are all skills that you have to acquire. If you don't already have them. And as I said, it's a lot of work. And I think it uh, I think it it keeps some people out of the game when they have this this little niche that they can still hold on to for the last, you know, <laughs> squeeze the last little bit out of it, you know, yeah. but it's coming. You know, it, there's no two ways about it. Rates have dropped. Uh, titles have dropped. So there's less opportunities. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> worse. They're not even paying on time now. Uh, oh, I've they, heard a lot about it. Yeah, that. it's like a 30 day window That's now. Whereas back, Chuck and I, I, I used to be able to go in on, I think it was Wednesday and uh, Wednesday or Thursday with the artwork, bring it in and get a check that day. That was the only great thing about freelancing versus advertising, which paid better is that you had a 30 day window in advertising, but in, in comics, that was the one thing they did because, you know, they knew they weren't paying great. There was no royalties at the time. You know, at least we can get their paychecks out. on yeah. time. You know, yeah. cool. Anything you picked up uh, certainly in this regards, Chuck? Well, I just think it, it, I just feel bad uh, for all of these underemployed artists. Uh, a lot of them at the peak of their powers and they're sitting waiting for the phone to ring and they're yeah. waiting for years the phone to ring and they're only getting by doing like commissions for fans. Yeah. And it's like, that's not the same as comics. You know, you're, right. you're out of the game. You're so talented, but you can't, and, but I, everybody can't do what Graham's doing and what you're doing. I can't, I, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, I'm just not built that way. And, yeah. but, you know, but I still look for work everywhere. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Sergio Cariello is always a huge inspiration for me. That guy could turn over a rock and find a comic book sign. I mean, he's just amazing. There's, a, there's, a, there's an excavating company in my area, and its logo is by Sergio Cariello. I mean, um, he and he got into the doing the uh, the Bible adaptations and never looked back. I mean, he's yeah. selling bigger than any of us. Yeah, you know, he, he's he, he has sales in the millions worldwide, and God bless him. But yeah. he's one of those guys, man. He never stops looking. It's a grind. I mean, I think that's the biggest part of it that, you know, I, I'm right there with you. There are a lot of definitely artists, definitely artists that are just in, extremely talent and talented. They can't possibly do their best work because, again, I feel like it's like everybody's holding these. So it's a Mexican standoff, right? Everybody's holding these ideological guns to each other and they're, um, you know, waiting to cancel each other over the, the most silliest thing. And I look at it just from a creative perspective. How can you possibly do your best work when that that's the case, when you're living under those conditions where it's like uh, even as talented as you may be, it may all be gone tomorrow because of the fact that, well, it's um, the industry is doing what the industry does. But also your colleagues are, I mean, essentially your enemies and they're like waiting maybe to boost themselves up to, to get you up out of there and 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 make something that is insignificant for the most part and blow it up to be this nonsense. We've seen people, hell, a lot of people that are in our space came from that, right? It was like right. the, it took a can some weird old cancellation. And then uh, thankfully uh, this space has caught them and they've been able to do a lot better even than what they were doing as uh, creatives in the mainstream. I guess that's the silver lining of it all. But you know, there's a bunch of people that are still there living under those conditions that are like, right. Man, this this sucks because just you can't even be at the proper mental state and doing your best work when you're stressed out. 
certainly uh, 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 about that stuff. But I do take pride in being able to give people gigs like that and being able to do stuff and uh, have people even just my day to day employees and stuff like I talk about that all the time. Like that to me is uh, what it's about. We talk about parallel economy stuff all, all the time. It's like, look, man, if I can put myself in a position to be able to employ and contract people to do great work. Right. um that that means the absolute world and they don't have to you sit up there worried about oh am i gonna get freaking canceled because of uh something i said that was a political opinion on twitter or some stupid stuff <laughs> like that like no they don't have to worry about that with us and uh, i've seen i'm living and breathing example of that or this company is that people are doing incredible work when they can work under those uh right. conditions but sure you know to, to certainly trans transfer into kind of what's really important I, i'll start with uh you graham we talked about this obviously on our on our stream uh with really just everything you know with uh mm -hmm. ghost of matacama key we talked about uh, all the other stuff that you're working on or have worked on in in uh compass comics where i'm looking at it right now uh, with this being at 136,000, please give us a brief synopsis of what this certainly is, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kind of uh, what what direction you're going with the company. Absolutely, Well, thank you for the opportunity to do that, Eric. Um, <clears throat> when I started my company, you know, I, I didn't want to do superheroes. I figured that was a market that was already handled by Marvel and DC. I wanted to tap into genres that uh, uh, that are, are underserved. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, I was a monster kid and I decided, well, uh, I'd like to do monster comics, comics about supernatural or, or science fiction or uh, mystery, uh, but all with a tinge of adventure. So every one of my books is, is, has had that kind of um, um, purview around it. Mm -hmm. um, the Ghost of Matacumba Key is what I'm calling the linchpin of my Nolan verse because um, each one has been an individual standalone story, but there's Easter eggs in every one of them, which will all be tied up and tied together in this book. Uh, so when you're done reading the Ghost of Matacumba Key, you're going to see how it ties together with Joe Frankenstein, with the Chinoo, with Alien Alamo, and my first book, Monster Island. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been having a lot of fun. Um, just kind of like peppering little things uh, in my stories that, you know, sharp eyes will catch, or certainly they'll, they'll reread it after reading this book and say, Oh, look at that. There it was. <laughs> it was right in front of me. And I didn't know it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Uh, what it is that you're doing with this, uh, with the company in general. Um, you know, we've again talked about it on your channel. We talked about it on, on mine is, mine as well and uh just um certainly admirable definitely considering the people that you know you've been able to team up with as as well uh you know with uh with the two-fisted like uh manly tales and mm -hmm. uh everything with definitely our man's kevin grievous uh oh, yeah. uh I, I love that uh those opportunities that are being created certainly out of this and also you know to your point you know it's, it's also cool that you know, even though definitely like I some we're, we're really trying to do a lot of the like the superhero stuff. But there's a place in comics, certainly in the American industry and in American market. I think a lot of people sleep on the fact that there's other stuff out there. I hear a bunch <clears> of people, <throat> for example, that'll say something along the lines of like manga's doing well, which I disagree that manga's doing well because of the fact that they have these diverse different things. Of, of, of I'm like, well so does american i don't know where these guys have been but you know there's a lot of stuff that's in there you I mean you may have to go to the independent stuff uh that's outside of that realm you know what i mean and you guys obviously uh, definitely with the monster stuff that you guys are uh that you're doing i think is not only admirable but definitely for those that are watching this that are that on the channel you got it right here you know what i mean if you want something uh that's maybe a little more of a different beat here it is uh, uh uh right here so with this how long was i know we're at 136 uh thousand how long are we are, are we running this uh campaign when well this looking? one is in demand now and it'll stay okay. in demand until i'm ready to uh fulfill which okay. should be in august august gotcha <laughs> yeah yeah that's okay. that's the target date to get all the files ready and, and uh, uh have it printed up and, and start fulfillment okay cool so august is what we're looking at can they uh for the stuff that's already out Mm -hmm. um, or that has already been, um, let's say, printed. Is there any other work that definitely is part of uh, Compass Comics that people are able to, let's say, if they wanted to get some of the mm -hmm. other books that they're able to get and it get fulfilled um, fairly early? 
Yes, um, uh, you can you can add all those things, all those books as add-ons in uh, if if you back uh, the Ghost of Matakumba Key. But if if you if you want to get the stuff um, uh, that came out earlier uh, sooner. Uh, then you can get it at compasscomics.com. Compass uh, the com. store is there. Uh, uh, the Alien Alamo is the only one that's out of stock right now, but okay. it will be back in stock uh, uh, like second week of April. Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, yeah that sounds uh, absolutely good. I know a lot of people are going to ask that about, okay, I want to get in now. Uh, where, where is there some stuff so they can go right directly to the uh, compasscomics.com? You right. go directly there. Some of his artwork is insane, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, they can go right there and then pick something up today. Um, and some of that stuff can get uh, filled kind of fairly. And you guys like the interior stuff. You're seeing it right here. Yeah. Uh, look, man, like I said, I, pages are up. I, I, I'm, I'm stoked that, again, this is something that, you know, obviously with your upbringing, this is something you've been passionate about, monster stuff as well. And for you to be able to kind of live that out and do that within your own within your own company. And like you said, people are. People are kind of into this stuff. Um, I'm absolutely uh, glad that you're seeing this level of success it is that you're you're, you're seeing, man. Because every time I turn around, you guys are uh, are doing some killer numbers with your stuff. And you, you know, we talked about the level of professionalism that you, in order to see that repeated success, um, the level of professionalism that you have to have, and you've been nailing it uh, definitely with making sure you know stuff gets finished, uh, getting it fulfilled, and all that stuff. That's what's going to keep people. Uh, keep people around so again big shout out <clears throat> to you and i know from a from a just experience standpoint that it's not easy man um you know you're you're having a way you got on several different hats uh and you're having to pay attention to that level of detail to give the audience what it is that they want so again absolutely stoked um for for you and what it is you're gonna we're, we're gonna get into joe frankenstein because it kind of ties both of you guys uh in but there's some other individual work that you're a part of uh chuck i, I see obviously your boy zach's always talking about uh, <laughs> uh this right here and how does something like this even happen like you know with a team of freaking sylvester stallone um like what in the what was that process well i, I did a, a expendables prequel comic that sly read and really liked and he called me on the phone Oh, wow. Uh, and told me how much he liked it and would I want to help him do rewrites on the second Expendables movie. That didn't work out. But unbelievably, even though it didn't work out, usually that's the end of the Hollywood story. You know, oh, you didn't get the job. Screw you. Right. We, we forgot your name already. But Sly kept calling me. Uh, and he got me work doing some web content for Lionsgate. I did dialogue for an Expendables video game. And once in a while, he would just call just to shoot the shit or complain about something <laughs> because I wasn't in the industry. He knows I'm not going to tell anybody. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, but he was telling me about, it. he wanted to do a, a, a comic called, or he wanted to do a movie called expendables go to hell. And I said, what's that about? Well, they go to hell, they die and they go to hell. And they fight the devil. And I said, they're never going to let you make that movie. And he goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> I said, like, It'd make a hell of a comic. So that's when I got a hold of the Richard who's like yep. the number one Expendables fan in the whole world. And I said, sit down, Richard. I got something to tell you. You know, we're going to do an Expendables comic. And we did that, and it was a big success. Graham was a big part of it. Um, and uh, big success for Richard. And then we we pitched to Sly, what about a Rambo graphic novel uh, showing Rambo's first tour in Vietnam? Basically, how John Rambo became the character we know. Okay. And that's what this is. Okay. I absolutely love that. And uh, like I said, to be even team up with Sly has got to be massive yeah. um, in, in itself. But to have like this is just a cool all around project and big shout out to uh, your boy, Zach, or Richie Meyer, whichever you want to call him. That's making something like this happening. I mean, seeing how how insanely successful that it it had it's been, you know what I mean? With being almost at one hundred and seventy uh, five thousand. And he's good on making sure everybody stays up to date. Um, if yep. you guys want to uh, go, you know, follow his page, uh, definitely on YouTube. He's always keeping people up to date. Really, a lot of his videos, he'll talk about it at the beginning. Like this is the state that this book is in. So if you guys want to get up to speed um, with First Kill. But you also got this other deal, which I'm more I, I got a lot. I'm not going to lie. I'm like incredibly uh, I I intrigued by let, let us know the siege of the Black Citadel. What? that is certainly uh all about i know your experience uh with with conan had to be like 
easy kind of hand and glove fit for everything it is you're trying to do here. Let us know what's going on. Well, uh, Ark Haven asked me, they, they told me Conan was in public domain, that the, mm-hmm. the Robert E. Howard stories were in co- public domain. Uh, and I thought, oh, man, they're going to ask me to write Conan comics. And instead they said, uh, have you ever thought about writing a Conan novel? And I'm like, oh, hey, I never had thought of that. You know, and I thought, well, let me take a whack at it. By that afternoon, I had the plot. And then it was just a matter of uh, getting my head around Robert E. Howard's writing because I wanted to write it the way he would write. Okay. Because it's a short novel. He only wrote short novels. He didn't write 500-page fantasy by the pound novels. Yeah. And so I stay within that. And uh, I've already written the second one. I've already started the third one. There will be three of them. Beautiful. And it's nice. it's classic Conan. It's it's nothing, you know, nothing added, nothing subtracted. It's it's that's what know, that's, that's violence. What, and, it works. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. You guys can get this. Um, I have all the links certainly in the description. Really for everything that we're talking about here uh, today. But the Siege of the Black Citadel, you can actually get a paperback from Amazon right now. Um, again, we'll have that link for you in the description. Uh, for everything and uh, Chuck's been doing a lot um, you know with uh, you talked about Ark Haven talked about all these uh, you can go reference our last interview to talk about or see some of the stuff that it is that we discussed but you guys are teaming up on something that you know I, I really want to get some more information on just yeah. definitely because obviously both of you guys are a part of it and um, with the with the Joe Frankenstein and um, we, we know we talked about some of the relettering and all the stuff that you you, you know you're going to be doing in the future. Let us know what the state going into Joe with Frankenstein part one, the state of it uh, and how you you know you kind of encompassing this and, and sort of uh, compass comics this go around and kind of what the what is the ultimate um, I won't say end game, but like what's what are you trying to do with certainly uh, this franchise or rather this character? Well, we, we, we want to get more stories out uh, about Joe. Uh, th- th- this original series was published by IDW in 2015, uh, and they did a sort of a piss poor job of promoting it. Uh, the the lettering I didn't like um, and the rights reverted to us. So <clears throat> when uh, I decided I wanted to bring that into the Compass Comics banner, um, we didn't have the those original print files, which was actually good because we had the full color files and all we needed to do is get it relettered, which I wanted to do anyway. So uh, we have Carlos Manguel who did uh, Bane Conquest for us. And uh, he's done uh, almost all the Compass Comics stuff. He's a really great letterer and he's really bringing something to the pages. And uh, so <clears throat> I've broken the the book up into the first two issues plus the the, the prequel, which was only available in the hardcover book, okay. and then part two will collect the second two, and both books are going to be 72 pages, um, 64 pages of story, 72 pages of with extra goodies and stuff like that, uh-huh. uh, behind the scenes stuff, um, and then that's going to set up everything for uh, its inclusion into the uh, uh Nolan verse uh, v- vis-a-vis uh, Ghost of Matacumba Key, and then it's going to allow Chuck and I to start creating new Joe Frankenstein stories now that everybody's up to speed. Okay, okay. And um, so you're going to be including Joe Frankenstein in the, in the Nolan verse, is that correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. It, it was actually mentioned in the first book, uh, The Chinoo. Okay. Uh, there's a, a sequence there where uh, a doubting Thomas doesn't believe in this ice monster. And he says, oh, yeah, I, I'll bet you also believe in that old chestnut about the, the kid and the monster living in the grain elevators. Uh, that's a direct reference to Joe and the monster in their grain elevators, uh, uh, which is part of uh, that story. Okay. Oh, so that's an it. example of one of those little Easter eggs I, I drop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, I think uh, that uh, will be, I think that's a big part of it as well. I think uh, definitely with the American comic book scene, anytime you can get, uh, no, it doesn't mean that every character has to know each other or anything. Right. Any, anytime you can get like a shared uh, sort of space for these uh, people, definitely if they're like a certain event is going to impact that world, it, it, it allows people to kind of buy into that stuff. And that's really something that, has been really unique in the American comic book sense, and I'm glad that that's something I did that you're doing. Uh, definitely with this, with it, with your uh, universe, man. This mm-hmm. art is sick uh, on it. So again, we're gonna have all of the links and everything uh, on this in the in the comment section, as well as the pinned uh, 
com comments uh, so you guys can get up to speed and go support the work of both of these brothers. Is there anything else that you guys kind of want to and we can discuss that, you know, you all are working on that you want people to keep an eye out on, like maybe going into the future and then the upcoming months? Uh, if so, I just wanted to give both of you guys the floor before we close out on uh, what, what all you got going. Well, I think we want to talk about spin rack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, since we since we uh, just dovetailed from Joe Frankenstein, a spin rack is an education, uh, not education, uh, um, uh, a, a game and entertainment company that Chuck and I are involved with. And we're releasing a, a, a match three mobile game next week uh oh, beautiful is our is our target date for release of that uh, uh, uh and and it involves um all of uh, well not the ma the mass free will involve three of our ips it'll be joe frankenstein chuck's law dog and his uh my sister suprema and uh so we're launching with those properties first but the whole company is going to be based around uh, uh, uh ip that chuck and i create yeah it's always my job here to say we didn't license this to spin rack we are spin rack it's creator driven, creator owned, and we got a lot of talented people uh, in in tech, in finance, in film, uh, working with us to put this together. Okay. Yeah. Eventually, you know, we're, we're going to be releasing uh, uh, utility NFTs, um, which will get you actually real world stuff, uh, and it's not just that pie in the sky stuff. Uh, and um, uh, we're sort of trying to reinvent what comics are and the interaction of um uh of the fan base within the comic universe uh which is going to be um completely different and, and and i think interesting for for fans that as technology moves away from pulp as we get into into this uh, um new uh, web3 and um, um uh, metaverse universes you know yeah okay cool it's always interesting to see how people can implement like new um different like the as far as the technology you know what i mean and implementing something that is going <laughs> to uh, take advantage of it let's say that because i mean that's really what people were able to do with the whole crowdfunding and the internet element it's always trying to be forward thinking and i think that's what the industry was meeting and this is why so many people are kind of trying to catch up right now because they didn't need at minimum give it a shot it doesn't mean that everything in itself is going to be a, a massive hit but you know technology is an interesting thing man and uh it has uh certainly changed my life and to be able to to be full thinking about that stuff is kind of what the industry is going to need so i'm interested to see interested excuse me to see what you guys are going to be able to do um with spin rack and really just obviously just as a big big fan of both of you guys just everything it is that you're doing uh in the in the future and you know we we all um I, I know i asked both of you guys the original question of what it would take to get you guys to work with the riververse um uh, before you know what i mean and what i what, what we could do uh because i would love to team up certainly with uh with both of you individuals i think the audience certainly will love it as well but regardless of what it is that you guys are doing is certainly admirable you offer a level of um just expertise like i said that i admittedly just don't have and that perspective is so important for understanding the the state of the comic book industry i'll end on this last question uh before we kind of uh, depart here um i am a, uh, i'm i'm sort of uh not sort of I, I am still as my dogs are going crazy right now um <laughs> i'm I'm stoked on the future. Let's say that. Uh, and American comic books. Is it, do you guys get a sense of that as well? I know with the mainstream, it's been going like down and we can say that, but I think there's a lot of people that are looking at the ball. It's just rolling on the ground. They're picking it up and they're saying, you know what? There's something that we can, we can do with it. I know that you need a certain a bit of humility to admit that like the Japanese are kicking your ass in your own market. And uh, that leaves a sour taste in my mouth. And I'm like, we should be far more competitive than what it is that we are. We're sure Japanese at minimum are showing that people want comic book related material. We should be able to give them something it is that they want. Uh, so considering where the independent scene is uh, and what we're going to be able to do, do you have that similar level of uh, optimism? And yeah, it may look different. You just talked about what you did with spin Rack it may look different going into the to the future but that's something it is that i i, I welcome and it's still for me i'll start with you chuck it, it, i'm i'm optimistic about the future what it, what what about you there's always going to be comics you know and we have our ups and downs and peaks and valleys but i think we're heading into a good place and uh especially seeing the stuff being uh creator driven 
and and you see what creators can do when they're left alone to their own devices. Uh, I'm I see more exciting projects now than I've seen in a long time uh, mm-hmm. coming out from you know a lot of guys I know, a lot of guys I don't know uh, that I want to be I want to see it, I want to read it. I like comics, I want to yeah. read some good comics. So this is you know they're not coming out of the big two. Mm-hmm. They, they, they don't you know care about me. They don't seem to care about anybody as an audience. Uh, but you know, uh, guys like Graham and other guys, you know, directly serving and listening to their audience, uh, that's the future. I, I, I think it's bright and I think we, we can get back to where we were. Mm-hmm. What about you? Albert? I, I, I want to thank Marvel and DC for shit in the bed because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because if, if they were rolling along like they were in the 90s there wouldn't be this this this, this opportunity and uh you know right. nature abhors a, vo- a void and there's a void people want entertainment they want good comics they love stories um that's why i am so excited about the future that uh there's these new ways of presenting stories uh the world is a giant place and there's so many different tastes out there there's plenty of room for everybody to find their market you know it's getting the word out there that comics are still here that they're viable and here's how you get them now you don't have to go to these you know comic shops slash porn stores because <laughs> you know some of them you can't tell the difference yeah, that's true. Uh, Right. You know, but but, you know, and, and that that puts on, you know, uh, an onus on the store owners too to create a welcoming atmosphere for people to come in sure. uh, to buy their products. You know, a lot of these European comic stores look amazing. It's like walking into an Apple store, but it's for comics, you know, and everything looks so cool, so well organized. Um, but I'm digressing here. Uh uh, but comics, you know, as Chuck said, are always going to be here. The need for stories uh, are, are always going to be here. It's how we present them that may change. It might not be paper anymore. Um, who knows? But I, I think it's a. I think the future is bright. Same here. I am. I'm stoked. I'm stoked on it. Um, I'm living, breathing example that there's a a demand even for people that are just kind of hopping up on the scene. I'm so thankful for my audience for what it, what it is that we've been able to accomplish with the, the ripper verse, but you know, there's so many more uh, creatives new and old um, and there's a lot of opportunity. So even if it does look grim, maybe from the big two and that innovation is not going to come from it or that, that level of enthusiasm, which is really what comics is missing, at least in the North American sense that we really just don't have right now. And that's just general and genuine enthusiasm Mm -hmm. uh for when people see something and they're like i cannot wait to get it you know what i mean like that that's what's been missing and it's that that kind of uh let's say recreating that it's just not gonna come from the big dogs but it certainly can come from folks like ourselves so again i commend you brothers for everything it is that that you all are doing i appreciate everything it is that you guys have uh have certainly done uh obviously being incredibly vital to my growth and what I, some of the first comic books that I ever owned was, was your guys' work. And I appreciate everything it is you're doing, but more importantly that you're doing even better uh, now, uh, despite all the obstacles. I think that's something it is that, that the audience wants. So again, I appreciate both of you, both of you joining us here. Oh, you're very welcome. We're all in the same trench together, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's very true, man. All day, every day, man. We'll do how, it. How cool is that? You started out as a comic book fan and now you're a comic book publisher and uh, you got the two guys on the, whose comics you read, and we're all in the same trench together now. Yep. That, that is such a unique thing about that, comics, absolutely. you know. And, and that's the beautiful thing about yeah. it all. And that you know, I was saying this a little earlier. It's just how everything came full circle with this, and to be in this position is something that it's certainly been a dream um, for me. But you know, I I, I have mm-hmm. such um, like I said, just admiration for it is that you, if you guys' works and to be even doing like, like you said, to be in the trenches, certainly with you guys is uh, it is more than an honor. But yeah, it's something is unique with this industry that can even get you to that space where you can have a guy like myself come up on some of this stuff. And now, what do you know? You know what I mean? I'm working with and being colleagues with people that um i we were like legitimately vital to just my understanding of what this industry was and me falling in love love with it that's something that a lot of industries if if any can can't give you you know what i mean that's what makes right. it unique that's what makes it 
makes it beautiful uh, mm -hmm. as well. And that's certainly an opportunity that I hope we can we can even instill in uh, in future generations. Um, because again, like you guys said, comics will always be around. Um, and they may look different, but they're going to always be around. So I, I do believe that we're, we're going to be in a good spot. But again, I appreciate both of you um, uh, joining us again, uh, ch chat and, and, and commenters. We're going to make sure that we have all those links available. Please go support these brothers and both of their both of their efforts, because it is not only admirable, you are supporting OGs, man, as I call them. And, uh, you know, if you, if you can in any 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 way, shape or form, support them. Make sure you go go do that we'll have those links again guys i appreciate you so much for uh for joining us and we're gonna certainly do it again probably not as much of a buffer as we had last time uh to see how often we can do this because i know this is a conversation that just uh is so intriguing by the audience so thank you brothers for all that you do and i appreciate y'all joining me thank you for having us on eric yeah it, we really appreciate it thanks a yeah, lot we really do thank you it's always fun wherever you're viewing the content I appreciate you. If you enjoyed it, you may be interested in my comic book company, Riververse Comics. Our first book and campaign, I Sum Number One, brought in $3.7 million with tens of thousands of satisfied customers. Visit Riververse.com to check out our store and stay up to date with the latest campaigns from one of the hottest new comic book companies. Also, my first big step towards a parallel economy was the development of my personal website, EricDJuly.com. This entirely replaced my Patreon. Now, if you enjoy this content, please consider becoming a member over at the website. We have an ever-expanding list of perks for various membership tiers, a forum, and a phone app. Some of these perks will even benefit you if you're fans of the Ripperverse. Anyway, I appreciate you so much for being a supporter and or customer. I even got a little love for my haters.